Uh, I'd like to welcome now Professor Megan Sullivan up. She is a Professor of Philosophy and the Reverend John A. O'Brien Collegiate Chair at the University of Notre Dame. She teaches courses at all levels, including large introductory courses like God and the Good Life. She's the author of Time Biases, A Theory of Rational Planning and Personal Persistence, and has written for a number of different magazines and journals. You can find a short biography that sounds similar to the one I read uh, on the page after the schedule. There's also a set of recommended readings. You'll see that for all of the speakers today. If you're interested in what they have to say, you can find more here. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead and welcome Professor Sullivan to the stage. Thanks, Austin. Thank you guys so much. You, you cannot imagine how excited I am as a philosophy professor to see a bunch of really smart high school students get up really early in the morning voluntarily, I hope, on a Saturday to talk about William James, who's been dead for about 100 years, but whose presence is going to live on, I hope, in you guys and some questions that he's going to inspire for you today. So I'm Megan Sullivan. I teach at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, half of my job is doing research, and the big thing that I do research on is time, rationality, value, and meaning. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how we make sense of meaning and value in our lives, especially given how short our lives are in the huge scope of the universe. That's a question that I think about a ton. The other half of my time, I do a lot of teaching, including this really big freshman class at Notre Dame called God and the Good Life. I have to show you guys our incredible web page because this is like one of the signature accomplishments of my life, is getting this web page up. Uh, we have a big web page about the class. And basically, the idea behind the class is when you come to college, you're going to start training for a career. But that's not the only thing college can or should do for you. And in fact, that's not the only thing that should be the focus of your life when you're 18 to 22, 23 years old. There are other questions that you need to start wrestling with because these are going to be big adult questions that are just going to occur to you over and over and over again through the rest of your life. What does it take to be happy? How do we make sense of the fact that someday we and everybody we know and love and even people we don't know and love are going to die? How do we make sense of the fact that there are some questions where there are persistent, complicated moral disagreements and nevertheless we need to come to a decision about what to do with other people? Are you going to practice any religion as an adult? So is Catholicism going to be part of your life permanently or is it the kind of question that you're going to need to revisit from time to time? Those are all questions that probably have already occurred to you, but as you move out on your own and you start shaping your adult life, you want to have good answers to those questions, even if they're still like provisional answers, still answers that you think you've reasoned through, you know what your evidence is for those reasons, you can explain yourself to other people who are going to question those reasons, and you know when you're having a crisis or when you're in doubt where you can look for help. Because that's the other thing about these big questions, about the meaning of our lives and about what it is to lead a morally good life. You might think that these are the kinds of questions you have to solve on your own, but that's pretty naive. That's like believing every time you get sick, you've got to make your own antibiotics somehow. Like you just have to ignore the fact that there are a lot of other really smart people throughout history and now who've thought about the same issues as you have. One of the things we push on students at Notre Dame and in God and the Good Life is that even if at the end of the day you take a critical outlook on some of these key philosophical and theology ideas of the past, you can still think about critical outlook, but you should know what they are. You should at least know and really understand what it is that you're rejecting or diverting from. And so we want you also to have that kind of foundation going forward. So today I'm going to give you a preview of one of the topics that we have a huge debate about at Notre Dame in this freshman class. And that's the question about how you decide as a good person what you're going to believe. Some of, my question, some of my students think this question is very abstract, but one of the things I hope to convince you of today is it's not very abstract. There are lots of people who have to make really important business decisions, life decisions every day that reflect their standards for evidence. The way I'm going to structure the session today, I'm hoping it'll be a little bit interactive, is I want to talk a little bit about a philosopher named William James. He's not a Catholic philosopher. I'll give you a little bit of his background. But he is famous for promoting this really interesting solution to the puzzle of what a good person should do when they feel like there's an important belief that they don't have personally satisfactory amount of evidence for. And James particularly applies this to this question of what it means to be rational in your religious faith. So I want to give you a little bit of William James just because he's amazing. He says a lot of stuff I really disagree with, but disagreeing with James is going to be an opportunity for you to think really hard about some interesting questions. 
I'm going to introduce you to James's theory, and then I want to talk about two current issues where knowing about William James and having wrestled with this question about the relationship between faith and evidence is going to be really important to people who are making some tough decisions right now. And then we can talk about those cases and how you guys would decide those cases. Um, to get us started, though, let's talk about William James. How many of you guys have ever heard of William James before? It's totally fine if there's crickets. All right. So William James, he's like one of the very few A-list American philosophers. Most A-list philosophers are Greek or German or Chinese in the scope of world history. But James is like as close as America's ever come to somebody who's taken really seriously in like the pantheon of the history of philosophy. He's writing in, uh, in the late 1800s, the essay that I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about today, he was writing in the 1890s, so kind of near the end of his life. He's from Minnesota. Is anybody here from Minnesota? Nobody? All right. So James is from Minnesota. He was raised in a Swedenborgian family. Is anybody here have a Swedenborgian background? I'm thinking probably not. This is usually what my students at Notre Dame say, too. Swedenborgianism, it's this kind of like low church Protestant movement in Minnesota at the time. James's family was very interested in Christianity, was kind of experimental about how they practiced it, and were very curious about different religious traditions. So Christianity was kind of part of the air that James was breathing growing up, but it was also a kind of like open-minded, very non-dogmatic version of Christianity. James also suffered from debilitating depression through most of his adult life. So he would go through periods of really dark ideation, suicidal thoughts, and he really credited his intellectual work and some of the philosophical theories he developed for helping him get through these really dark periods emotionally. And in fact, if you read a bunch of William James's philosophy, you'll notice, unlike many other philosophers who are real heavy hitters, he focuses a lot on the way we connect up our emotional lives with our intellectual and evidence-seeking lives, which is kind of a cool feature of James's philosophy. I don't want to talk about James, big picture James today. I want to talk about a particular essay that James is famous for that will give us some stuff to debate over the course of the day. So in 1895 or so, the student philosophy clubs at Yale and Brown invited William James to give a lecture to their undergraduate philosophy club. This might seem like a big deal, but if you're like a big shot A-list philosophy professor like William James and an undergraduate club invites you to give a lecture, normally your first response would be to like throw the letter in the trash bin. Maybe your second response would be if you happen to be in the neighborhood, you'll turn up and like give some off the cuff remarks. James does something completely different. He accepts the invitation and he writes a brand new paper to deliver to those students. So brand new philosophy to deliver to those students. And it goes on to become one of the most important essays that he's ever written and probably one of the most important essays in contemporary epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. What is that paper? It's called The Will to Believe. If you want to check out excerpts of it, we have a really cool interactive essay on our God in the Good Life webpage. But this should be on your like required reading list is just like a curious, decent person. It's a great article. James starts off the article, and the reason why he wanted to, to deliver it to the student group is he starts off the article saying, every time I'm talking with other Harvard professors, all they say is that all of the Harvard students now are atheists. Like, none of them are capable of genuine religious intellectual engagement anymore. And he said, I don't actually believe that about students. I think, in fact, a lot of our students still really do care about intellectual engagement with faith, and they're responding in different ways to different kinds of challenges that come when you try to realize that intellectual engagement, and you're also the kind of person who cares a lot about the evidence. So today, I want to address you guys, and here he's thinking of like a bunch of really smart men at Yale and Brown. I want to address you guys and raise for you guys this question about how we try to determine the role of faith in our intellectual lives given our concern for science and our concern for evidence. So that's it. The problem he's trying to solve for these students is helping them think about how to carve out a space for faith, especially faith understood as religious belief in their lives, given the complicated ways that, uh, that we might face trying to find evidence for those beliefs. So that's the basic gist of it. I got to give you like a little bit of philosophy jargon in order for us to have a completely awesome debate about this. So here's your little bit of jargon for today. If you were taking my class, this would definitely be on an exam. Um, but for, for now, I just want you to know what it is. Doxastic voluntarist. Doxastic in philosophy is just a jargony word that means has to do with belief. Beliefs, doxa is a form of belief in Greek. Voluntarism means under your voluntary control. So doxastic voluntarists think some of your beliefs are under your voluntary control. 
Doxastic involuntarists think the opposite. All of your beliefs are, in an important sense, not under your control. Now, doxastic involuntarists, James is going to be a voluntarist, the involuntarists think that there is a huge difference between our intellectual lives and our action lives, between our beliefs and our choices. Choices are within our direct control. So like who here, show of hands, if I offered to pay you $5,000, would stand up in this auditorium right now and shout the F word? Five grand? I would do it for like a grand. I'm not gonna, I would do it for a hundred. <laughs> your decisions about standing up and shouting things, those are within your voluntary control. And likewise, you could be held responsible for that. So you're gonna get in trouble for your teachers. You'll be removed from this conference. We can hold you responsible because you know, you chose to do that. Who here, if I offered to pay you $5,000, could believe that this room is empty? Uh, we got fewer hands. I had one student, I had a student, uh, or there was a student, um, uh, one of my colleagues was giving this lecture a few years ago, who gave that thought experiment, and the student said, who said that? <laughs> Which is pretty funny. <laughs> you, all right, you volunteered to raise your hand, so how would you do it? How would you make yourself believe that this room is empty? I don't know, I mean, maybe you have some like pharmaceuticals in your backpack that you could take, or you could like hit yourself really hard to make yourself no longer function rationally, or like respond to your evidence, your perceptual evidence rationally, but it's pretty hard to do. Oxastic and volunteers say, the reason that's hard to do is because evidence just pushes beliefs on us. It just forces beliefs on us. All of these sights and sounds and smells of other human beings in the room right now just force you to believe that this room is populated with other people. It's not the kind of thing that you and your will really play a role in. James is an example of a doxastic voluntarist, or at least he's often held up as potentially an example of someone like this. He thinks, well, perceptual beliefs might, in a certain sense, be not under your control. There are beliefs about uh, God, about religious faith more generally, about morality, about politics, about love, which we're going to talk about at the end of this talk that are in a really important sense under our control. We can, can be held responsible for the decisions we make. We can get it right and we can get it wrong. And sometimes practical values can come in to fill the gap, uh, where the gaps that we perceive between our evidence and the thing that we're aiming to believe. So that's your little bit of philosophy jargon today. You can sound really smart on Monday when you go back to school and tell people about doxastic and voluntarism. I should say there's a video of our grad student, Paul, that he's in this picture because if you also you go on the God and the Good Life webpage, there's a little video explaining it. That's the little empty lecture hall. Let's talk about why good people care about evidence. So I'm Catholic. Part of being Catholic means having a really complicated intellectual life. I mean, the Catholic faith makes a lot of practical demands on us, but it also makes a lot of intellectual demands. There's metaphysical beliefs. Somebody could be three persons in one substance. That's a real philosophical mind boggler. There's beliefs about history. There's beliefs about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are moral beliefs, beliefs about the right place to look for moral guidance and maybe wrong places to look for moral guidance. It's a big complicated intellectual tradition to be part of and it's a tradition that explicitly affirms the value of reason. Part of being made in the image of God is being made in the image of someone who cares about truth and goodness and thinks that those two are linked up. So the part of you that demands more evidence, the part of you that's sometimes skeptical when people tell you ridiculous things, that is a good part of you, something that should be fed. And any kind of religious tradition that tries to tamp that down is getting something seriously wrong about human nature. So let's just, before we get into James, who you might be tempted to think doesn't care about this part of you, let's just remind ourselves why this part of us is really important. We, uh, I go to this really hippie gym in South Bend, and all of the past week we've been having this raging debate about the Whole30 diet. Have any of you guys done the Whole30 diet? Uh, there's this big debate about whether this diet is a horrible idea or like the best thing ever. And, and then there's a second order debate about whether whole 30 people have good evidence for their nutritional claims or whether or not they have no evidence. And we know, we know as human beings, sometimes we have this tendency to just jump on the bandwagon and believe something is true, even if there's not very good evidence for it. So even if you think this one diet now is really good, there are other diets that people have followed at other times that are clearly really stupid. There's no evidence that supports those diets, but people were just willing to kind of believe in them, have faith in them on the basis of no evidence because maybe they wanted to be part of a social movement or part of a group, or they just believed because something was on the internet that it was true. 
An example of this, I think, is this like baby food diet for adults that some people are following, where you agree to eat baby food for most of your meals for 30 days. There is no evidence to back this up. People who are on the baby food diet, if any of you guys are on the baby food diet, stop. Or go talk to your doctor. This is not the kind of thing that you should believe just on the basis of faith. Or that kind of faith is misguided. That's denying an important rational part of yourself. It's important that you search for evidence about what to eat. Likewise, it's important for your life to go well that you search for evidence about these bigger philosophical and ethical and religious claims that are going to be important to your life. Now, flip side of that, or maybe an uh, analog of this, is there sometimes seem to be people who are willing to take leaps of faith, and it doesn't maybe directly influence their health or any practical aspect of how they live their lives, but it still strikes us that they're making a mistake or that they should be holding back and waiting for more evidence. An example that I really love, but now you guys are probably way too young to get, is The X-Files. Do any of you guys know about The X-Files? Oh my God. The X-Files was the greatest show in the 90s when you guys were just glimmers in your parents' eyes. The rest of us were watching The X-Files. And The X-Files has this character named Fox Mulder, who's an FBI agent. He's really into gathering evidence for claims. He's generally um, pretty interested in knowing the truth about things. But he has this one vice. He really, really wants to believe that there are aliens. And a lot of people are pushing back on this. For that reason, he has to work in the basement. It turns out he's right. In the show world, there are aliens. So he ends up getting vindicated. But he has this famous poster that says, I want to believe. Like, I just, I'm going to keep it open in my mind that extraterrestrial life exists, even if everybody else is telling me that's wrong. One interesting question about is whether or not that attitude is rational, even if it's not uh, in any way directly affecting his health or his physical well-being. You guys probably have already had some exposure to doxastic voluntarism. If you've ever studied Pascal's Wager, who, have any of you guys ever studied Pascal's Wager in any of your classes? All right, I'm gonna let you guys in on like a little trade secret. Most philosophers don't like Pascal's wager. They think it's a bad argument. Now, you know, you can still like it at the end. There are always some people holdouts that really want to defend it, even among professional philosophers. But I think it's good for us to talk about a couple puzzles for Pascal's wager, because that'll also make, uh, make it clear why people like William James so much. So Pascal's wager, Pascal is actually a super faithful Christian who believes that there's tons of evidence for the truths of Christianity. But at one point, he veers off and says, even if you ignore all of that theoretical evidence, I can still give you a practical argument for why you should cultivate belief in God, regardless of what the evidence says. And here's his basic argument. I kind of, I kind of simplified it for you guys. He says, we got a choice. We can either live our lives as though God exists, so attend church or synagogue or mosque, pray, try to cultivate belief in God, like read holy scriptures, read texts that are going to end up indirectly causing you to form those beliefs. That's one option. Another option is you could decide from here on out you're going to live your life as though no God exists. So you'll read maybe a lot of Richard Dawkins and Friedrich Nietzsche, William Clifford, who we're going to meet in a second. Uh, sleep in on Sundays, don't engage in prayer, try to hang out with people who are likely to direct you towards a more atheistic worldview. And if you're lucky, probably indirectly, this is a way that you can control your religious beliefs and you'll end up having atheistic beliefs at the end of this process. James says, which thing should you do? Well, regardless of what the evidence is, if, if you think there's even a minuscule positive probability that God actually exists, cultivating theistic belief is going to dominate cultivating atheistic belief. Why is that? Well, we're in one of two possible situations. Either God exists or God doesn't exist. If God exists and you live as though God exists, Pascal says you get the potential of infinite reward in heaven. That's like winning the lottery except infinitely better. If you live as though God exists and you end up in the scenario where there is no God, what have you done? I mean, you wasted some Sundays, but you still got like donuts after church. It wasn't that bad. You still got to read some C.S. Lewis. It was fine. What about the scenario where you cultivate atheistic belief and there is a God? Well, then uh, Pascal worries that you could be facing infinite penalty. That's like really bad outcome. Or you live as though no God exists and you're right. There is no God. Well, I mean, you don't even have an afterlife in which to feel good about yourself. Like you don't even like, what did, what did you win? I guess you got those extra mornings sleeping in, but that was about the benefit. So lots of philosophers, including a lot of religious philosophers, including a lot of Catholic philosophers, have issues with Pascal's reasoning. What are some puzzles that we could raise for somebody who's giving this kind of argument for why somebody should become, say, Catholic? Who wants to give it a shot? What are some questions 
you might have for this argument. Yeah, what's your name? Francesca. How do we know which one to believe? Ah, so one question is probably the simple two by two grid is not the right grid. I mean, there's a lot that's being clumped up together in these axes. So which particular religion do you practice, especially if these different versions of theism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, have disagreements about exactly what you need to do in order to access these benefits? That's going to be one humongous question. What else? Bells. Yeah. Um, it seems to be based on a self-centered risk analysis. But if you believe in God, it's not self-centered. It's more relational and other-focused. Oh, yeah. What's your name? Chris. Chris. Have you read William James? Oh, wow. So, Chris, you're just like a James savant. Because <laughs> this is exactly William James's problem. A lot of people bring up Francesca's problem. This is like a classical problem with Pascal's wager. But James's problem is actually slightly different. Uh, James's problem is that anybody who used this kind of argument to decide whether or not to become Catholic would be a tool, would be a bad person, just would not be successfully becoming Catholic or Christian or whatever religious group or faith that they wanted to cultivate. And why is that? Well, imagine, like, I'm a pretty rational person, and I study rationality. Let's suppose on, like, Saturday morning, I meet with my accountant, and I have a big discussion with him about where exactly to put my retirement money and where to put my money for taxes next year. And we do the math, and then I decide on that basis to make a bunch of retirement decisions. Good job. It's that, that's the rational thing to do. Suppose in the afternoon I read Pascal, I do exactly the same kind of math problem as I do for planning for my retirement, and decide on that basis, I guess I better become Catholic. I show up on Sunday morning, I'm sitting in the pews, I'm like, hey guys, I'm joining your church. Uh, they're like, oh my gosh, that's fantastic, like, what's happened with you? It's like, you know, the Holy Spirit's kind of approaching you and drawing you into communion. I'm like, no, 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 I don't, I don't know what you're talking about with the Holy Spirit. I just decided there was a slightly positive chance that you guys are right about this whole religion question. And just like I'm betting on the stock market for my retirement, I'm deciding to bet on your market for my afterlife. So I guess, like, you know, where do I sign up? What should I eat? That's like, you're not Catholic if you do that. Like, you have absolutely no relationship with God. You completely don't care about the evidence about whether or not any of the important claims of the faith are true. You're just in it for the afterlife, which is not even clear why you want that afterlife, because presumably the, the goodness of that afterlife is predicated on certain beliefs about the kind of God that you'd share that afterlife with. So William, just, William James says, like, anybody who's using this kind of reasoning to try to cultivate religious faith is failing. They are not cultivating what religious faith really is. But, he says, Pascal was onto something. Namely, that there can be important things that we value as individuals that don't have to be so grossly, naively self-centered, but just important personal values that might help us make this decision that we want to take a leap of faith, that we want to try to cultivate belief, even if we don't think that belief is being forced on us by a bunch of evidence that we've received. So he wants to find a way of explaining how that could work without reducing to the view that people who cultivate religious beliefs are just trying to do this like gross calculation about what's in their self-interest. So that's going to be James's goal. We've got to talk about some of James's enemies, and then we'll get the theory. And that, this part will go really fast. So James is thinking of some skeptical, uh, skeptical arguments that are in the neighborhood that he's going to try to resist and find counterexamples to. Skepticism in philosophy is just generally this, this like, attitude of cultivating doubt. It comes to us from Socrates. So Socrates thought the Athenians were way too confident that they were good people. And in fact, the role of a philosopher was to raise questions for them to try to get them to think more deeply about what justice really consists in. Rene Descartes thought that the scientific method means that we should try to root out all biases from our beliefs. Anything that we believe that's not on the basis of evidence, we should chuck it out. Does it, have you guys read the meditations? Seen meditation one or two? Yeah, uh, really quickly, where does that get Descartes around like the second meditation? He decides he wants to get rid of all his personal biases. Do you remember what he's left with as far as his beliefs? Well, like, well, he even believes that he, like, oh, do I even exist? Am I just in my own head? Like, he doesn't really believe in God. I mean, Descartes world-famous mathematician, basically one of the original like, founders of the Enlightenment, 
decides one day he's going to sit down and look at all of his beliefs and figure out which ones he can be confident are on a sure foundation. And he ends up within about a day realizing the only things he can really, he can't be confident he has a body. Because you have dreams sometimes where you have extra arms and stuff. You know, body evidence can be deceptive. He can't be confident that 2 plus 2 equals 4 because he can't be confident that God wouldn't just trick him about mathematics. He doesn't know why it would be important for a creature like him to have completely accurate mathematical knowledge. That's crazy. He makes his money off of mathematics and he's reporting that he doesn't know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Instead, he thinks the only thing he can be certain of is that he exists somehow right now as he's having that thought. He can't even be sure he existed five minutes ago. I mean, this is pretty, his, his like mental life gets pretty radically circumscribed. Hume is also a skeptic, but Hume's skepticism, he comes a bit after Descartes, is, uh, is less radical than the Cartesian skepticism we get in the meditations. One of Hume's big targets is religious belief. And he says, Christianity and many of these major belief systems, they ask us to believe in miraculous occurrences like the resurrection of Jesus. There is no way that there could ever be a satisfactory amount of evidence for a claim that is that surprising. So Hume says anybody that is appropriately concerned with rationality is not going to believe claims like the resurrection of the dead. This is going on in the back of James's mind, that there are criticisms like this of religious belief. The guy he's really directly concerned with actually comes quite a bit later than Hume and is a contemporary of William James. This is a guy named William Clifford. So Clifford is basically Richard Dawkins of the late 1800s. He's a Cambridge science professor, but he's also really interested in philosophy. He's publishing all these tracts that are kind of like the God delusion, trying to argue people like, wake up, sheeple, religion is false. Um, and Clifford is really famous for this principle that's being widely discussed at the time that's now, we now call Clifford's principle, which is basically kind of taking skepticism and making it moralistic. So Clifford says, it is always everywhere for everyone at any time to believe anything if they don't think they've got sufficient evidence for that belief. And then Clifford goes on to say, none of us have even close to sufficient evidence for some of these key claims of Christianity or these other religions. Therefore, not only are you failing somehow as a knower when you believe these things, but you're also failing as a person more broadly. You're failing to be a good person, which that's a pretty hard criticism. James, what he wants to do in this essay, and we're about to get to his theory, I promise, is he wants to find counterexamples to Clifford's principle. So he wants to find scenarios where, of course, you would agree that it is totally the right thing to do to believe something, even though it is also clear that you don't have sufficient evidence. Now, I'm not saying that this should be the Catholic perspective on religious faith. In fact, it's not. But I want us to look through how James provides counterexamples to Clifford's principle and then think a little bit uh, over the course of today how we might take some of his insights and either agree or disagree with them from a Catholic perspective. So let's talk about James's counterexamples, and we're also uh, going to start with our first case study. So to see our case study and to understand James, I want us to think a little bit about why some part of us totally agrees with Clifford. It is really important to be a good person that you try to seek out evidence for what you believe, especially when the things you believe are what James will call momentous, important. And an example that I've been thinking about a ton for the last couple of years is this example of Elizabeth Holmes. How many of you guys have heard about Elizabeth Holmes? All right. I listen, there's a great podcast about this story right now. I actually listened to an episode on the drive up this morning. Elizabeth Holmes, she's a student at Stanford studying chemical engineering. Uh, and her second year of college, she drops out to try to found a startup to disrupt the medical testing industry. So she does what Mark Zuckerberg did, what Bill Gates did before him, what a lot of tech entrepreneurs do, decides to discontinue her education and instead go full force with all of her being into a new industry, trying to develop a new idea that she thinks will change the world. Her idea is this machine that eventually gets to be called the Edison device. And the idea, how many of you guys have had like blood taken recently if you want to volunteer? I had to do it maybe a year and a half ago. So if you get blood taken, it really sucks. Like, it takes a long time. You have to go to the doctor. They take at least two vials. It hurts. It's disgusting. If you're like me, you need a cookie afterwards or something to feel better. It's a huge deal. And in fact, the fact that it's so onerous is the reason why some people won't get blood testing that they really need. Holmes says, I'm going to change blood testing so that you can get exactly the same testing with only two drops of blood that you get from a finger prick. 
This is going to change how hospitals diagnose people. It's going to mean folks that are afraid of blood testing are finally going to be willing to get important information about their medical histories. She starts this company called Theranos. In 2014, her company is worth $9 billion. She's one of the richest women, at least as far as net worth, on planet Earth. But there's a problem. Anybody know what the problem is? It's kind of signaled in this Wall Street Journal article that came out in 2015 by John Carreyrou. The problem is this blood testing technology does not work. There is no evidence that you can perform these old blood tests with only two drops of blood. And in fact, they have very little evidence that their testing is even close to the level of accurate that you need. So Theranos, in the meantime, sells their dream uh, to Walgreens. Walgreens decides to let 41 Walgreens in Arizona use Theranos blood testing to perform rapid blood testing results for patients. Theranos is returning really inaccurate information to those people. Some of them are cancer patients who are in remission, who are getting inaccurate blood tests that are telling them their cancer is back. A lot of people are getting blood tests telling them that they're healthy, and in fact, there's little, there's little to no evidence that that's true. She was, her and Theranos, they were not concerned with the need for accurate evidence. Now, there's one way of looking at her case where she just committed fraud, and her company committed fraud. They lied to people. But there's another way of looking at her case where it's just what people in Silicon Valley do. This is just what it means to be an entrepreneur. And in fact, if any of you guys have ever read any biographies of Steve Jobs, you know that he was famously like this. His employees said that he had this thing called the reality distortion field, which meant that Steve Jobs would come into a meeting in say 2003 and tell everyone, hey, guess what? In two years, we're all going to have computers, touchscreen computers in our pockets that are going to be connected to the internet and they're going to run all day on one charge. People are like, that technology cannot exist. Like, there's just no way to make electronics do that. You are crazy. And he'd be like, you're going to do it in two years or I'm going to fire you. And then he would go and release the press release. Hey, guess what? We've got new phones coming out. Before the phones were even like, Working, he would say that Apple was going this direction. And he could just, by the force of his will, seem to change facts about engineering. And he got really lucky. I mean, he really did revolutionize consumer electronics. How is Elizabeth Holmes not trying to do exactly the same thing with medical testing? And then just like the clock ran out before eventually this miracle could come in and change science so that her technology worked. That's a question that I want us to wrestle with. Now let's go back to James really quickly. We're going to diagnose Elizabeth in just a moment. But here's James's question. He thinks that there are some scenarios where a good person shouldn't wait for more evidence. Some scenarios you totally should. Elizabeth Holmes should have waited for more evidence. But there are some scenarios in which we shouldn't wait. What are those scenarios? James says that we, and he's addressing this to us as individual people, he says that we sometimes face points in our life where we have to decide what to believe. So we've got to make a decision that involves our intellectual lives that's live, forced, and momentous. What does live mean? Live means we have some options, and both or all of the options seem like they are authentic, real ways that our beliefs could be going forward. So an example that he brings up quite a bit is the example of religious belief. I think right now at age 36, I could imagine living my life going forward as a believing Catholic. I could also probably imagine living my life going forward as a Lutheran. It's not that different from Catholicism. The priests are like, ugh. <laughs> I could imagine my life going forward as an atheist. Like, I'd, I'd read different books, I'd hang out with different people, I would definitely do different things on weekends, I wouldn't come to conferences like this anymore. Those are all like live options for my intellectual life going forward. But some options are not live. I know almost nothing about Hinduism. So it is not a live option for me to think, at least in the near future, that I'm going to convert to Hinduism. Because I know nothing about it, it just wouldn't be like authentically Megan to make a decision like that. Likewise, I do know a lot about Scientology. I watch a lot of those documentaries, especially like late at night on YouTube. But that is not a live option for me. There's no way I could imagine like meshing the rest of the other aspects of my life with like believing Scientology going forward. So those are not live options. Other people might be in a different scenario. So Tom Cruise might be like Scientology is a live option, atheism is a live option, but Catholicism or Hinduism are not live options for him. James says it's indexed to particular people and the experience and culture that they've been part of so far, what's really going to be a live option for them making choices. 
This is how he tries to weasel his way out of Pascal's problem. Because he says the person who's accepting Pascal's wager is not really considering anything about their authentic like intellectual lives going forward. We could have a whole debate about whether or not that's the right problem with Pascal. I don't want to talk about that so much. Let's talk about the second aspect. James says it's not good enough that you be considering live options. It also has to be true that right now you are forced to make a decision about what to believe. You are not in a scenario where you could wait for more evidence. This is how he avoids his theory saying that Elizabeth Holmes is doing the right thing. Because Elizabeth Holmes, I mean, there's a sense in which she was forced to make a decision that this blood testing technology worked. She was forced because if she kept dragging it out, people were not going to invest money in her company anymore. But that's not a real sense of force. That's not like, like time itself is saying that your evidence is disappearing. Instead, it's a kind of force that she put on herself. James is going to say there are certain points where no matter what, the scenario means that we cannot, we could not wait for more evidence. Not just pragmatically couldn't, but we just couldn't, couldn't. Third thing is he thinks we are justified in taking a leap of faith when our decision's live, when it's forced, and when it matters for how our life going forward is going to go. And this is an incredibly interesting part of James's philosophy, and another thing I just want you guys to wrestle with today. We oftentimes think that the only value in our beliefs comes from the way that those beliefs lead to choices and actions. So if I believe that baby food is going to make me healthy, then that belief is valuable if, in fact, I eat a lot of baby food and it makes me healthy, and it's not valuable to the extent that I eat baby food for a month and I get really sick. Everything is focused on what I do based on the belief and not the belief itself. James doesn't think that. He thinks it's important how our beliefs connect up to our actions, but it's also just important to have beliefs, like your intellectual life, the inner life that you develop, and all the things you think you know, and the things that you worry about, and the things that you love to think about. That is also a way that your life could go better or worse. So James wants to argue that even if sometimes these questions of faith, we can't exactly see how they're going to connect up with direct decisions we have to make tomorrow, it still might be really important that we make investments that try to help us form these beliefs. And we're going to talk about that also if we have time in just a second. One last bit of philosophy, and then we'll get back to Elizabeth Holmes and the other case study I wanted to give you guys. So remember Descartes. Which school are you guys from? All right, so Chesterton, they know their Descartes. And we remember what happened with Descartes, at least in the beginning of the meditation. He starts cheating after that and tries to get a bunch of beliefs back by proving the existence of God in a really sketchy way and then trying to show that like, God revealed a bunch of ordinary things to him. It was, it, the meditations get weird. But the first two meditations, at least, when Descartes being really sincere about wanting every belief to be justified, he finds himself with very few beliefs that are safe at the end of that. James says... Yeah, you can be like Descartes. That's a way you can live out your intellectual life. But Descartes and the really hardcore skeptics, they owe us an argument about why that's the only way a good person can live out their intellectual lives. And James says, I don't see that argument. In fact, I see options. Some of us in our life of activity are really averse to error. I feel like I'm in this camp. My motto is, if it's snowing, I'm not going. So if I wake up and I'm invited to your birthday party and there's a little bit of ice on the road, mm -mm, I'm watching Netflix. I'll deal with this later. I do not base jump. I don't even go off, I don't even go off the low diving board. I just don't do diving boards. I'm very, very sensitive to risk in my personal life, at least in many things. Some people are not. Have any of you guys seen Free Solo, the Alex Honnold documentary? This is like, th that is a spectacular documentary about Alex Honnold, one of the best, the best free climber in the world, deciding to climb up El Capitan at Yosemite. Have you guys ever been to Yosemite? Oh my gosh, climbing up this sheer rock face with no ropes and no safety equipment because he just wanted to know that he could do it, which is crazy. He is willing to take a lot of risks for personal gain or for achievements or for personal flourishing. James says, just as we run our, our lives of activity in this way, we can also run our intellectual lives in two different ways. Some people could be like Descartes. They'd be like, if I find out I got a false belief, that is the end of the world. Uh, if I find out I've got a belief that was unjustified or biased, for me, that's awful. Same way if, like, I try to drive to your birthday party and I slide off the road in the ice. That's, a, that's the worst thing that could happen today. 
James says, yeah, that's one way of running your intellectual life, just like that's one way of running your personal life. But that's not the only way. There's also a flip side. There are certain people on the spectrum who want a lot of beliefs. They want a big, complicated intellectual life that contains more than just the fact that they currently exist as a thinking entity. Uh, and to do that, sometimes you've got to be willing to tolerate a certain amount of risk that you formed a belief, you had some evidence that you sought out for that belief, but it wasn't enough to secure your belief for sure, and as a result, it turned out you were wrong. So let's like dwell on this for just a second. James thinks he falls more in the second category. He wants a big, complicated, rich intellectual life, so he's willing to take some risks when it comes to the things that he believes. He's not going to demand always an amount of evidence that's going to be just overwhelming, overwhelmingly deciding that a, a certain belief is true. He still is going to demand evidence. And he still thinks it's bad if you find out that you believe something false. If you were a huge proponent of the baby food diet, like you should be embarrassed about that. You did not have a lot of evidence for that. You convinced other people of it. That was like a wrong thing to believe. If you're the kind of person who's just adamant that there's an even number of stars in the Milky Way and it turns out that you're wrong, well, I mean, it was stupid that you believed that so confidently over the course of your life. You should have like, been a little bit more skeptical or held back a little bit. James still cares about the truth of our beliefs, but he thinks that there are many cases where we don't have an overwhelming amount of evidence, but still to have a good intellectual life, to have a good life, period, we have to go ahead and believe. So he's going to try to come up with examples that kind of follow this recipe where he thinks these are not religious examples, but you already believe it is totally part of a good life to believe without enough evidence. So here are his examples. I'll give you two of them. First example, and this one is my favorite. James says when it comes to our love lives, we totally take leaps of faith all the time. Here's why. Let's suppose I'm in the early stages of a relationship with someone. We'll call him Brian. And it is really important for me to know whether Brian loves me back as I start to love him. And I can think of two ways things could go. I could think like I go ahead and believe Brian loves me back or I kind of hold off and emotionally distance myself from Brian. Those are two live options for me. It's momentous. If I decide that I'm going to love Brian and believe that he loves me back and in fact he doesn't, you know, we're only a week outside of Valentine's Day right now. My heart's going to get stomped on. This is going to be just like devastating for me. If I believe that he loves me back and he does in fact love me back, that's going to be awesome. It could be the start of this absolutely amazing relationship. Likewise, if I hold back, that's going to have important consequences for both my emotional life and for my romantic life. So this decision has a lot on the line. It's also, and this is the interesting part, seemingly forced. I've got to make a decision early on, before I've got a ton of evidence about what's going on in Brian's head, if I'm going to believe that he loves me back. Why is it forced? Why am I forced to make a decision before I've got all the evidence in a case of love? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Yeah, what's your name? Sophia. Sophia. So one thing, the, the clock is ticking, and Brian might not be willing to, for, to wait too long for me to make up my heart on this question. So that's definitely one issue. Sophia raised a good issue. I think there's another issue, too, that might make it forced. One is, like, Brian could be forcing me to make a decision, but let's suppose Brian's willing to wait me out. Why would it still somehow be inappropriate for me to keep looking for more evidence about whether this person loves me back in order to believe that they love me? Yeah, what's your name? Laura. Laura. Yeah. So Laura, let me give you some like unsolicited relationship advice as your as your elder up here. <laughs> if you're in the early stages of a relationship and you are constantly demanding evidence from your partner about how they feel about you, that is going to destroy your relationship. If you say like Brian, I think this is really working out, but I need to go through every text on your cell phone. Or I need you to write an essay to me explaining exactly why you love me and what conception of love is operative for you before I make up my mind about whether or not I believe that you love me. That is going to basically prevent Brian from loving me. Like the, the, the act itself is self-defeating. It the, the demand for evidence is stopping love in that particular case. James says we do this all the time. We take leaps of faith in our personal emotional lives all the time. And in fact, Demanding evidence is antithetical to this other concern of wanting to cultivate a loving relationship. 
Another example he gives us is case of moral beliefs. So let's suppose I'm like hanging out in downtown Chicago late, late tonight. That's not something I'm currently planning on. But let's suppose I am and I'm walking out of a bar and I see two guys and they look pretty drunk and one is shoving the other pretty hard and I don't really know them and I'm not sure there are two live options for me. One is that first guy is really hurting the second guy or he's abusing or victimizing the second guy and this is bad. Another option is they're just two drunk friends having a Chicago shoving match. Stuff like that happens in Chicago, I'm led to believe. And they're having fun and I shouldn't intervene. This is a live forced momentous decision. Momentous because somebody could seriously be getting hurt. Forced, why? Why is my moral belief, my moral interpretation of this case something that seems to be forced? I gotta make up a decision now. I can't get more evidence. Why? Yeah. Someone could actually get hurt. Yeah, I mean this goes back to Sophia's point about the relationship too. Like the clock is ticking. There's shoving happening. These guys are going to be halfway down the street in a minute. Something really bad could be happening. And I could try to, I could go home and like try to Google these guys or do research or whatever. But by the time that happens, the opportunity for action will have elapsed. So that's another way in which our decisions can be forced. James thinks Elizabeth Holmes' decision to tell the world that this blood testing technology works, not forced. Why was her decision not forced? Put her not forced. Why do you think her decision was not forced in the same way these other kinds of decisions about what to believe are forced? Forced means, remember, you can't wait for more evidence. So what's true about her situation? Yeah. Yeah, so one thing is, if her situation felt forced to her, that was only because she wanted all this money. It wasn't forced in the sense that like, the clock was ticking on whether or not some uh, like, life-saving blood testing technology was going to become available for humanity. That's one key difference. Another key, like even more simplistic difference, is that every morning when Elizabeth Holmes showed up at the office, she could write an email to her lab and just ask them to try a new test, to try to uh, inquire in a new way about ways they could improve the technology. She had a lot of options for requesting and getting access to new evidence. Here's an interesting question about James's view about philosophy of religion, and this is where I think there's like a live debate. Are we in Elizabeth Holmes's scenario when it comes to finding evidence for belief in things like the truths of Christianity or belief in God? Or are we in one of the James's scenarios like the moral belief or belief in love? Where does religious belief fall on this spectrum? So for James's solution to work for saying that we're rational in believing really complicated religious truths even if we think we don't have overwhelming evidence. And again, I'm not saying that that is the assumption that we should make about our evidence, but let's suppose that it is. Are we forced as individuals to make up our minds about these questions, or can we be skeptical, or can we wait for and demand for more evidence? What might be some ways in which our things like belief in God or theological beliefs are different from beliefs about whether or not blood testing technology works? Somebody want to take a shot? Yeah. What's your name? Jill. Jill? Mm -hmm. So Jill raises a really interesting point. This is totally relevant. The momentousness question. Like blood testing might feel momentous, but it's still quite narrow. It's the kind of question that you can investigate, but you can have a, t a framework in the background that really has nothing to do with blood testing that you're using to judge your standards and judge your evidence. Whereas when you decide whether or not to believe in God or to become Catholic or to become Muslim or to become an atheist, you're not just picking single beliefs, you're picking like a whole understanding of what belief is in and of itself. So you're not only picking a particular hypothesis to go for or against, but you're also picking like a methodology and you're picking an understanding of what yourself, who you are yourself. There seem to be a lot more moving parts. That might mean that this decision is really momentous, but it might also mean that there's no kind of neutral skeptical stance you can start off from. 
<laughs> that's going to be one issue. What's another issue? What's another maybe disanalogy between things like belief in God or belief in major truths of Christianity and belief about whether or not a piece of equipment is working? What are some other differences? I mean, can I do the equivalent? This is, and this is, I'm, uh, like, I'm not fishing here. This is like a live, interesting question for us as Catholics. Can I, as an individual, do the equivalent of Elizabeth Holmes emailing her lab workers? Can I say, like, God, I'm like, woke up this morning, I'm like 40% confident that you're three persons in one substance, 60% confident that these things happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, but uh, I'm going to need you to give me like a new, new bit of information today, and that'll up my confidence uh, to perform another test. Does it like work that way, even in prayer? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> religion because that isn't the right method. Like there are different methods for different things and if you are using the same method for every single thing in your life, then that's never gonna work. You're never gonna be able to discover what you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, let's focus on this point. It might not work. I mean, you can pray to God about anything, you can, literally anything. I pray to God about philosophical things all the time. Like, God, exactly how should we formulate the impermissive hypothesis so that this paper gets published? You can ask that to God. You can ask God very theoretical questions. But we know for a fact in a lot of our prayer lives and in just the history of Christians wondering about these questions, the answers you get back are, are not usually the same as emails you'd get from a lab tech. Uh, the answers are some, usually just an intense feeling of God's presence and love or things that are reaffirming really basic parts about your relationship with God. I don't know about you guys, God usually does not answer my really specialized philosophical queries in direct ways. If he does, it's an indirect way. I meet a friend who leads to a great conversation, which leads to an insight. It's complicated. So the question is, like, God is not somebody that we can just hit a button and get evidence from the same way we can do with somebody in a lab. That's got to be one part of it. What's another part of it? There's this interesting question about like, what kinds of things is skepticism the appropriate attitude to have towards, and what kinds of things is skepticism just seemingly the wrong way to go? One specific example, and I'll get to you in just a second. One specific example I think of all the time is like, again, going back to the personal relationship question, beliefs about love and beliefs about family. It just seems really inappropriate for me to be skeptical about whether my mother loves me. I mean, I just have like so much evidence over the course of my life, but even thinking about the evidence is also screwed up. Like, if I were to sit here in front of you guys and say, let me tell you seven arguments for why I'm confident that Mary Sullivan loves me. It'd be like, I have a weird relationship with my mom if I treat her that way. Somebody that like I'm gathering sociological data every day about her feelings towards me. Because like the way that she's giving me that evidence about her is not the kind of way that permits writing sociology papers. It's just a different thing. The, the very fact of treating her this way is somehow ignoring the fact that she's my mom. And also, like, if I'm finding myself really skeptical about whether my mother loves me and I do in fact have a really healthy family life, this is the kind of thing that I shouldn't see a philosopher about or a sociologist, I should see a therapist. There's like something messed up with my like emotional affective life if I'm having these kind of skeptical worries. And that's the thing that needs to be addressed. I don't need more arguments or more evidence. I don't have to like have my mom write an essay about how she really feels about me. Instead, I just need to work on the ways that I'm engaging with her. You might think that at least for some core claims of theology, it's like the same analogy. Like the, the way that you deal with skepticism is going to be appropriately different in those scenarios as it would be if you're gathering evidence about some objective impersonal subject matter. So that's gonna be another issue and one that James is also really concerned with. I'm about to go over on time and I want us to talk about one more thing. Ugh. Okay, finally I said, I promised Austin I would make this Catholic. James, uh, James, you know, James walks right up to the edge of this view that we call in philosophy and theology, fideism. So defending the view that religious faith is held without evidence, and fideism is basically uncool. It's philosophically uncool because it denies the fact that we really care about having evidence for our beliefs. It's also theologically uncool because even if we think we're not getting evidence for uh, the deep truths of Christianity from like a lab that's currently performing experiments, we still know that there's a ton of evidence. What kind of evidence or evidential sources would we look for? So if we can't get it individually by like asking God to create lab reports for us, what can we do? Like what, what are the sources of evidence for thinking through these questions? 
What have we got? We've got so much. Where would we look? Yeah. I mean, we look into each other, right? So we look into other people, and other people are all presumably having experiences of God that are different. God's reaching out to them in different ways, but we're able to share that knowledge. St. Augustine has a really beautiful theory of how that works. I think that's got to be part of it. What else? Are we limited to the year 2019 in our knowledge of God? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, we've had like 2,000 years of conferences on this question of God. We've got this rich tradition of Holy Scripture. We've got a bunch of people who lived with him and had experiences with him in the form of Jesus. We've got people who lived before that that had experiences of God. We've got really smart people who've uncovered little pieces of the philosophical puzzle and then have argued for that and shared it with us, like St. Anselm and St. Augustine. So we've got a ton of material to work with. The question is, this is really communal material. Unlike performing a test on your own and observing the results, it's the kind of material that requires a great deal of trust in other people in the past and in other people who currently live. And that also gets our moral lives involved in really important ways in how we'd access that evidence if it exists. So that's going to be a big question. Chesterton, uh, I think, is a really good example. He's, if you, any of you guys have read G.K. Chesterton, he's absolutely brilliant. He's writing roughly around the same times as, as William James, and he's a convert to Catholicism, but he makes some points that are very Jamesian. And particularly his points about how a lot of us, when we're managing our intellectual lives, uh, even though we respect Cartesian skepticism, we also don't want to end up the kind of people with really small intellectual lives. Instead, we're pretty happy to have big, chaotic belief systems that we realize might need more work, but at the same time, we're willing to entertain all of these beautiful, cool hypotheses together to try to make them work, rather than uh, uh, artificially or quickly dismissing beliefs. So I like this aspect of Chesterton. Let me give you one more case, and this is a final one that might give us some grist to talk about also at this conference. So James thinks it's going to make a huge deal to how well your life goes if you end up living a life where you turned out to believe truths, truths about religion, truths about your mother's love, truths about your relationship, truths about morality, he just wants a complicated intellectual life. He thinks there, there are benefits. In, that one of the benefits religion gives us is this complicated, beautiful intellectual life. Is that right? Like, is that something we still actually believe in the year 2019? I think a lot of folks, when they talk about why they think their religious faith is good for them and their lives, they list out practical benefits. At least if you guys are anything like my students, you say, my church gives me a great community, my church helps me to become a better person, it gives me opportunity for social justice service work, I know that the people I go to church with would take care of me if I got really ill. Are those all of the momentous reasons to take a personal leap into religious faith, or do we still really believe that there are intellectual reasons as well? And I bring this up because this is a major cultural topic for us right now. Uh, the New York Times did this absolutely amazing series uh, a couple of years ago where they looked at people who thought all of the benefits of religious faith for me are practical benefits, and then I discovered I could get even better versions of those practical benefits by things that are not organized religion. So the best of these stories, and I recommend you guys read it, is people who decided they were going to quit their church and their synagogue and instead throw themselves wholeheartedly into their CrossFit gyms. Does anybody here do CrossFit? I belong to a super culty gym. I spend way more hours per week at the gym than I do at church. I don't know if I should also say this in front of the priests. I do go to church all the time, but I spend more time at the gym. These people are reporting, look, if you care about like opportunities for close friendships, people who care about my personal flourishing, where flourishing is understood in a pretty physical way, people that would care for me if I were ever sick, I'm getting much more of those benefits from my totally awesome gym than I ever was from my church. Therefore, CrossFit is better at delivering the goods, the religious goods, than religious belief is. Because the other upshot of CrossFit is, like you join CrossFit, you gotta believe some weird stuff about gluten. This is where the weird diet stuff becomes really relevant. But they don't actually make many demands on your intellectual life. I don't have to believe anything. I don't have to say any creed before I come to the gym. I can just start doing things with my friends. It doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do at all with my mental interior life. Is that a benefit of these movements? Or, or do we in fact believe that there's something about having a certain kind of intellectual life that in self is momentous for people like us? and would mean that we have to really care about whether or not we have enough evidence for some of these key claims of the faith. 
I think it's a huge question. It's a difficult one to answer, but one that we need basically the smartest 2019 minds to be chewing over. It's a big question for the direction our culture is going in. And it's also just a big question for how the kinds of investments that we're going to make in our lives going forward so that we can ensure that they're really good ones. So those are all topics I just want to kind of put on the plate for today. Uh, and I do want you guys to be thinking a little bit as Catholics and as intellectuals, how we approach culture in Silicon Valley right now, how we approach fitness culture right now, and all of these other ways that we're engaged with the modern world, because I think these are not simple questions, but they're ones that we can actually make a lot of progress on. Thanks.